Shout out with Sage. Shout me out. And that's all I got. So shout out and let's go. Hello, everyone. I am Sage Stevens, the host of Shout Out with Sage on Stream and Hub Radio. Today, my guest has his doctorate in education. He's executive produced movies, and he is the founder of Brankov Financial Services. And I would like to welcome to the show today, Konstantin Brankov. Hi, Konstantin. How are you today? Hi, Sage. How are you? I'm good. I'm not sure if we can see you. Hopefully, the audience can see you. I cannot see you. So, okay. <laughs> so, we met at a at a film industry event a while back, and you were investing in film. Can you tell us what was some of the good points and bad points about that industry? So, the film industry is a quite a fascinating industry. Actually, it's it's a wonderful industry, uh, especially if you're an investor in it. And especially if you know and like uh, creative aspects of filmmaking and you like storytelling and you enjoy um, getting some ideas or concepts that you can share with the world uh, or maybe in certain cases, particular audience and particular people, um, it is a very wonderful industry. Um, it is an industry that is filled with, sometimes it's a very difficult industry to, to break into. And sometimes it's a very difficult industry to find good products because mm -hmm. it is a product based kind of right. industry where you find a product and then you nurture the product, you develop it. They call it finding the product, you create it, you develop it, and then you, you know, arrange where people, good people, uh, come, come together and, uh, are excited about the product. Uh, there is, they're fine with relations with it and in a way that they're, oh, wow, this, this makes sense. I like it. I like where this is going. And then they encourage it and they become a catalyst to get the product out there into the real world. And then hopefully, you know, if it's a good enough product and it's a good enough accomplishment, it's shared with the world. People like it. People resonate with it. People enjoy it. And then, um, you know, it gets passed on to everybody across, across the nation. How did you go about picking your projects? So the projects that I picked were very, very simply uh, given to me throughout typically how the film industry works on how my experience with it, in my opinion. Uh, you have you have meetings, you have friends, especially if you live in Los Angeles and you are prone to being somewhat of a open to an artistic <laughs> nature of social butterfly. Yeah, social butterfly. Yeah. <laughs> You're out there mingling. Yes, through mingling. I think you and I have met several times at different events. Yes. That's how we've become quite good friends uh, over the years. And we've, we've met each other in quite a few of them. So what happens at these typical events is you meet people that you trust and have uh, friendships with, you build uh, acquaintances with. And most of the people have uh, some ideas, some concepts, uh, a film, a script, uh, an idea that they would like to get out into the real world. So if you look at filmmaking as an idea, a concept, a story that you want to tell and move it out into the real world, I think that's the best way to go about doing it. If you're looking at it, oh, how do I make money? How do I meet these people? How do I do that? Typically, that's not going to take you very far. So you have to look at it as a business. And as a business, you want to find a product that you believe is going to resonate with a lot of people. A lot of people are gonna enjoy uh, the aspect of that because as a filmmaker and as people that wanna see films, they really wanna try to be transported into a new idea, a new concept, somewhere where they're somewhat detached from the real world for a period of time, mm -hmm. where they can really kind of fall into something that they love and something that makes them feel better. And in some cases, we believe that, or I believe at least, if you really give them a good movie, you're almost healing people in some way because you're letting them relive certain ideas, certain concepts that they've maybe experienced in their lives and they resonate with that again. They feel that out again and they like it. It brings them back to a certain time. If you attach music onto it and great visuals and so on, it really fascinates certain people. It fascinated me too. Right. Why are you still doing film finance or have you sort of stepped away from that? So I have stepped away from that temporarily. Why have I stepped away from that temporarily is because I expanded my family. I got married. Uh, I 
I had a child about 12 years ago. Her name is Sophia. Mm-hmm. And uh, I couldn't run my financial firm and dedicate quality time to producing and making films. Mm-hmm. So uh, you can't raise a family and do two full-time kind of positions at the same time. Right. Um, I do believe had I stayed with the film, you know, I had some great mentors out there that really are quite up there in the studio system that really wanted me to be involved. I just couldn't, uh, I'd rather, uh, fortunately I wanted to raise my child and then eventually I knew if the business is still there and if the business would still allow me down the road, I would definitely tap back into it. I have had some offers and some ideas now that we, I am looking at it um, and hopefully we'll see if I transition back slowly into that because my children are now raised they're right. a little bit bigger, and so now I can take off some of the time where they don't need, you know, I became a helicopter parent where I was really wanted to be with them all the time, take them places, enjoy their time, and really, really be with them. So you couldn't do both film finance and your your own company? Correct. So so the, right. the foundation of myself and my success was the Brankow Financial Services, which is you know, our, 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 you know, our foundation right. of you. And so out of that, it allowed me, because we were somewhat of money managers, allowed me the knowledge and the experience of how to take a product, develop it, and put it into the marketplace. Once you know how to do a product, it doesn't matter what product it is. It can be film, it can be a bicycle, it can be, you know, the old adage of widget, any widget you want, you take right. the widget and you transport it through the industrial line of whatever it might be and you get it to an end product, and then you share it with the world. So what would you give someone as some tips in getting that product to the marketplace? So I, what I enjoyed very much uh, immediately when I saw somebody that's absolutely passionate about what they are introducing. So what most, if you look at Hollywood these days, mostly the successful TV shows, films, or so on, have a resonance with somebody that is their life experience. Um, And so because it's their life experience, they really are able to connect with something. It's no longer just an idea, but it's an idea that has been lived through. And when you have somebody share an experience that they've lived through, um, you know, you could feel it that that's something that they want to share and they're not going to give up on that idea or that concept. And usually the ones that don't give up on the idea or the concepts are very confident and, you know, very continuously stern about this is my idea, this is where, and they don't let the system itself or the process change the idea so much that it's no longer their idea and they lose interest. So those people that are very passionate about the product, which is their story, their music, their dance routine, whatever it might be artistically, Uh, Those are the people that I really found interesting. And those are the people that I wanted to do business with because I knew that they would not sway down the road and they would finish till the end. A lot of people, unfortunately, give up very easily in this business. Mm. Uh, And so you have to understand that this is not a business where you give in. This is a business where you get up and get up and get up, get up and get up and get up. Yes, um, with the film, you know, yeah, with film, you have to keep going. You have to be persistent, or any creative endeavor, or even any business when you're an entrepreneur. Correct. So, how did you become an entrepreneur? Like, what made you decide to open your own, your well, own financial I, company? So a little bit about my story. I I went to I I grew up in South. I'm originally from Romania, and I okay. emigrated to this country when I was about eight nine years old. And we grew up. My family and I grew up in South Dakota. Yankton, South Dakota was the first city that we grew up. And so um, and then my parents were educators and uh, and so on. So we lived in South Dakota. I went to college, University of South Dakota. And then I wanted to become a doctor. I really liked medicine and biology and so on. And what occurred was um, I went to, I was doing a PhD MD program where you do the PhD first and then you go into the medical. It's called M Mud FUD. Okay. And after one year of the, PhD program, I really was overwhelmed and it was, I felt that it was not something that I wanted to do. And so I told my parents that that's it. I'm, uh, I'm no longer going to pursue that. And, you know, they had their first heart attack with me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, we've all disappointed 
parents yeah, I, here I and there. <laughs> yeah, my parents were, it, it was such an extreme where they literally were, you know, I think I did affect their life. I, I shortened their life by at least three or five <laughs> years, I think, so. Yes, yes, I, I've, done, I've done that a couple of times myself, yes. Yeah, so. And then at that time I was I was dating a girl and uh, she says, I'm, I'm moving out to Los Angeles. And I said, well, why don't I come with you? So I moved out here to Los Angeles and for about six months or so, she was an agent, she was a movie agent. I was not interested in, in, in entertainment at all. She was a movie agent. Uh, she became an agent with a pretty well-known agency. And, uh, you know, I, I got exposed to the business. And about six years to six months to a year later, I told my parents, hey, come out here, check it out. It's a really nice place. They came and visited and both of them moved out here too. So we have a whole <laughs> family out here. Because when they saw the weather and they saw the people and all that, right. the different culture, it's a wonderful culture. They really enjoyed it. And so they moved out here. And then my father was involved as being an administrator in Compton Unified School District. My mom was also involved in uh, education and administrator. And then I also started teaching. So I started when I was 24, 25, I started teaching at uh, Dominguez High School in Compton. I wanted to change the world. My parents have always been educators and you know, do that. So I was an educator in physics and biology and chemistry. Uh, and then I did that for about a few years and I slowly transitioned into finance because somebody came to our school and was showing people how to invest their money for retirement. And what happened was I was telling his agent, one of the owner's agent, better of how to invest money than his agent was <laughs> telling me. And the guy offered me a position and he says, you know what, why don't you just do this after school? I know you're a teacher and I had a whole plan on becoming a teacher and then an administrator and all these things. So I was, that's why I was getting my doctorate degree and all of that uh, in education because I was planning on eventually becoming a principal, a superintendent and transitioning high up the ladder in administration. But I deviated through finance because this person really thought that I was good at math and fortunately I was. And so um, I started working part time. Well, after about three, three, three and a half years, um, I, I figured out that what I was doing was a little bit better than what they were doing. I didn't like the direction of how their business was being done. And so I bought myself out. I said, you know what? I bought myself out and I started my own firm. Um, and went to, I got some money from the bank. I got some money from my parents. And so we opened Branca Financial Services in 2003. Okay. Uh, in um, uh, August 1st, 2003. And we've been slowly building it since. So it's, it's a good 20 years or so the company has been has been around. So you were South Dakota, then LA and film, and then education, and now your own financial company. It's sort of definitely a, a, a different path than probably you set out at the beginning, correct? I would have loved somebody to ask me, what do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> I never got, no one asked me, so I had to figure it out on my own. Okay. Well, given your, your finance uh, experience, what are your opinions on the current economy right now? So, you know, we're, we're very, we have a very, very dichotic kind of a, a polar uh, opinion out there. It seems that somewhat like half of the people think that we're in somewhat of a severe recession. Uh, that things are looking pretty bleak out there with the, the high interest rates, the Fed continues to raising, uh, you know, raising the rates today that they, they actually stopped, but we'll see what happens. And then there's people on the other side that think this is the best time ever to invest because we're having technological advances that are quite outstanding, meaning they're uh, this AI expression where artificial intelligence is going to help productivity anywhere, but they're predicting by 25 to 30%. They're predicting comparable to a million to five million jobs might be wiped out because they will no longer be needed uh, by a typical human being because the AI or the okay. intelligence will step in and transition that. So that's where we are right now. I do think that if you have a long-term perspective, investing in America uh, is a great place to be and it's a great place to invest. So I do believe that eventually we'll come out of these doldrums that we're having currently but we will eventually get to a place where we'll be a little bit more stable. Right. 
Um, in a recent speech by Jack Sullivan, the National Security Advisor to President Biden, he was saying that the United States, that national security of the United States is tied to its economic strength. Um, he stated that U.S. economic strength and national security are threatened by excessive dependence on China. What, what's your thinking on that? So China is a, a huge, huge, huge economy. It's second, I believe, to the United States, or if not a second or third. So you have to somewhat be friendly with China. I understand their way of living, their system, which is partly communist, partly uh, capitalism, partly there's there's a mix there. It's not just communism. Um, you know, we have to understand them and they have to understand us and we have to work together. But I do believe that if there's not effective communication between China and U.S., the world suffers. We think that the world economy will suffer because these are two independent, powerful nations that have very, very specific ideas and concepts of where things need to be and things need to go. We would like most of those ideas and concepts to be aligned with one another. If they don't and they're contradictory to one another, that could be a very, very difficult challenge going forward. You have to understand that right now, China, Russia, they're starting an old system, the BRICS system, where they're actually removing the U.S. dollar from circulation in certain parts of the world, uh, not permanently, but you know, within different transitions. Um, and they're pushing for independent countries to have their, for example, Russia rubles and China won and all those independent currencies to be fluctuating on the market. Uh, and the dollar is no longer the international currency, or they're trying to remove in certain areas of the world that. So that is something contradictory to what America believes in America wants. Right. America yeah. believes in what is called the petrodollar, the, having the dollar buy all oils, all commodities in all the world. So you know, we have to understand that there's people want different things and people always want to have a competition one with the other. So right. we have to be able to strategize in a way that our message to them and their message to us is, hey, we're all in it together. Let's work together as best as we can, respect mm -hmm. each other as best as we can, and move forward together as we can. How, how does the cryptocurrency come into that? What are your thoughts there? So very good question, Sage. You're very smart. Uh, cryptocurrencies are actually a, a way to bypass uh, the use of one domination or many domination of currencies um bitcoin there's ethereum there's you know over i believe yeah. seven thousand different coins that can so what people are trying to do in my opinion with bitcoin and so on they're trying to bypass the bank system the central bank system where they're establishing a currency that no longer has dominance on territory meaning it's not geopolitical whether you right. live in estonia Germany, wherever you might be, Bitcoin is a common cur common courtesy and common currency around the world. So that's what I believe all coins are doing. It. They're having a difficult time in America now, as we see that the Securities and yeah. Securities and Exchange Commission are heavily going after these firms that allow trading on their platforms. Uh, there's just another one the other day, and so on. So. All these platforms are being somewhat um, attacked, not attacked, asked to, to elaborate more. And they're, they're, they're transitioning the altcoins and the coins into more securities based. Once they become somewhat of a securitized based, um, and again, this is something that I think will happen, then the Securities and Exchange Commission has to come and over, you know, overlook everything uh, and establish certain rules and guidelines that don't allow currencies, cryptocurrencies, to have most, if not all, the freedoms that they currently have. Right well, now, that's to protect consumers, correct? Correct. One yeah. of the things is their ideas is to protect consumers. Uh, it could also be that there's a lot of promises made by cryptocurrencies that somewhat don't make sense or sometimes don't even add up. Right. So it, it's a, you know on one side you have to understand that with everything there's two stories to every story. There's right. one person that says this and one person that you always want to meet in the middle as much as possible 
because even the extreme ideas somewhat have unity together in the long run. Mm. With the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and First Republic Bank, um, I think we were all shocked to see the government have to bail the banks out without any prior warning. Can you explain what happened to the banking industry to cause the banks to fail overnight? What's your opinion on that? <laughs> very, very good question. So you have to understand that banks are uh, experts and what they do is they lend money. They lend money at a certain rate. Uh, a year ago, uh, the prime rate was somewhere around one and a half to 2%, depending on when you look. Uh, the federal, uh, you know, the, the federal raising of rates as, as it's happening now is causing an impact because you're you're loaning money at three percent but now it's costing you four or five or six percent banks usually offset that by holding bonds and treasuries and so on but the math just didn't add up and so when you have so much money going out at a certain rate but it's costing you a different rate to get it back in that can cause stress and tension within the banking system uh, sometimes when, for example, Jerome Powell raises rates at a substantial fast rate like we've had last year, um, it causes a, a, a major disturbance in the financial system. The financial system is a huge, huge, huge system. And mm -hmm. when you change it dramatically, it has waves and implications throughout all of the economy. By changing a rate within one year from you know one and a half to two percent to five five and a half almost they're predicting five and a half a substantial change within one year. Had this been prolonged over two to three years, I think most banks could have incurred the change dramatically instead of letting it hit and influence them very much. What did you learn from the last recession that is shaping your current investment philosophy? You know, I'm still having a challenge with that now. As a matter of fact, uh, today I was having a little bit of a uh, come to Jesus moment, as you say, because uh, we don't, we're having these cycles that are very, very abrupt, uh, very fast up, very fast down, very fast up, very fast down. Uh, typically, if you look at history, um, things were a little bit prolonged, a little bit slower to get to certain aspects and certain targets. Now it seems with huge, huge technological advances in trading stocks and bonds and all that, um, there's major fluctuations continuously. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I learned from last time is, you know, you have to stay in the course uh, and you have to have a discipline saying, where, where am I going to be in five years? Where am I going to be in 10 years? Where am I going to be in 15 years or 20 years, depending on your time frame? And sometimes when you lose perspective of a long-term perspective, the short-term uh, anxiety and short-term, uh, you know, frequencies really, really, really sometimes mess with your emotions and mess with your way of thinking. So I think it happens to the best of us. Sometimes you choose a path of investing. For example, we're choosing a more conservative path right now, but the market is showing that that's more, we want to transition more towards an aggressive, more towards an, uh, you know, everything's fine, let's move forward and let's grow and grow and grow. So mm -hmm. we always want to learn where we need to stand, but we want to get as close as possible to understanding where the economy is. What would your advice be to someone who's looking to, you know, invest right now and is concerned about inflation and the market volatility and all those things? So for, first of all, uh, you have to begin with the end in mind. What is this money used for? When will I need this money? And how much of this money am I willing to invest? Now, once you begin investing, investing has different ideas and concepts. First of all, you have to understand that there is risk and risk tolerance based on how much are you investing in certain aspects of certain asset classes. Some asset classes are very aggressive. For example, we talked about one of them earlier, cryptocurrencies, right. incredibly aggressive in many people. People have lost 90% in some cases on different altcoins. So when you, when you meet with somebody or when you talk to somebody about investing, you have to really get a good, fine, direct picture 
of what it is that they want. So we have to begin with what do you want and where do you want to be? Once you have some type of a knowledge of where you are and where you want to be, we find we find the buckets. I say buckets of investing. Do we need to put five to 10% of your bucket? Let's say, for example, mathematically, we come with, let's say, $100,000. And somebody would say, hey, I'll have $100,000 and I want to use it for retirement. So if we know we have 10 or 15 years for retirement, then that bucket can be a little bit more aggressive than somebody that says, hey, in six months, I'm going to need this money back. Hmm. Because nobody as smart as they are can determine where the next six months of the market will be. We do know effectively that probably in the five to 10 years or 20 years down the road, stocks and companies that you buy now, based on inflation that is happening, will typically stay with inflation and beat inflation, which right now is comparable to about eight to 9%. So we know that in five to 10 years from now, we want our money to grow at least with COLA, which is cost of living adjustment, and beyond that, and beyond that inflationary product. So that's what we would do. We would look at exactly where you want to be. How do we get you there? And these are the different products and investments that might fit you in the road to that outcome. The U.S. Treasury um, stated they're going to issue nearly $1 trillion in securities in the next few months. Um, How do you think this will affect the U.S. economy overall? So you have to understand that the uh, treasury treasury bonds, treasury yields, treasury bonds are very, very short term money that banks use, individuals use for investing. Right now, I believe they're comparable to around five, five and a half percent. So this is a great time for people that are not very um, understanding, (laughs) not very loving of the stock market. Right. Uh, this is a great place for them to park some of their money. And although inflation is 7 or 8%, they're still getting a pretty confident return of 5 5.5% with little or no risk. So the more treasuries on the market, I believe that there's enough demand that will meet the supply that they're willing to put into the market. I believe that there's a lot of clients that are very happy with a 5% return and they don't have anything to do with the stock market. What do you see overall happening in the next, let's say, year in the economy? As we started this conversation regarding the fact there's two opposite, complete opposite ideas. One idea is we're going to go to all-time highs. Everything is great. Sunshine ahead. Let's party. Another a camp is a camp where, hey, this is, this is going to be challenging. We might be entering into a recession. It could be a prolonged recession or it could be a short recession. But nonetheless, there's a recession that might be happening. This is the other camp. When recessions typically happen, what happens primarily is people lose their jobs. So unemployment goes up. Right. Uh, spending goes down. Uh, credit cards, uh, start, people start you know, defaulting on credit cards, car loans. Uh, you have to understand that in about three months, we're having a student debt issue coming up mm-hmm. where in no matter what, September 1st-ish, whether whatever's happening with the case right now that is in the Supreme Court regarding uh, Biden's uh, student loan forgiveness or not, September 1st is the first day that people with substantial amount of debt in student debt have to start paying it back. So you're having all these different things coming into play where the bear camp, there's a bull camp, which everything is fine. Bull and bear markets, right. Bear market, the bear camp is saying, All these bad things are happening. We want to be very careful investing in the stock market in the next 6 to 10 to 12 months. So you have that major dichotomy. Probably nowhere in history has there been such major dichotomy of bulls and bears. Usually everybody's quite comfortable with each other and they understand. But right now there's severe extremes. As a matter of fact, there's, I believe, the most short positions out there on the market. Short positions are something where people bet against the market very aggressively uh, because they believe that the market will go down substantially. As an entrepreneur, what were some of the struggles that you experienced when you were first starting out, you know, in your business? 
you know, one of the things that I didn't do well from the beginning is I didn't understand having a mentor or having a group of people that are supporting you mm -hmm. and guiding you through. I was always, uh, because I'm the only child, I was always an independent and I can do it myself. I don't need anybody. I don't need to, you know, the, the old adage, uh, ask for help, dummy, when you need it, you know? <laughs> Uh, I was not, I was not the ask for help dummy kind of guy. I was, I can do right. it myself, you know. So I would have definitely have expanded my network. I did have a network for business, but I didn't have an immediate network for guidance of my own particular, you know, you help so many people out there that you forget that, hey, I also need help too. And how do I replenish that energy, replenish that education that I also need in that motivation? Right. Um, I eventually later on figured that out. But probably when you start out, get a good team together. Now, you might not be able to get a good team right away. Uh, but with technology, here's another example where AI comes in. There's many AI tools. There's YouTube channels. There's different free networks, TED Talks. All yes. these things where if you don't have radio shows, imagine how beautiful this radio show <laughs> is to add on to your, one of your... <laughs> one of your lists of places right. to learn and be, get, be guided very effectively down the road. So you have to get some type of, of, of network that helps yourself. And then you do the business and expand it that way. So that's definitely something that I, I would have done a little bit more better. What is the best piece of advice you've been given so far in your, in your career? Life is tough. Never, ever, 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 ever give up. Let me repeat that in case you missed it. Never, <laughs> ever, 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 ever give up. No matter what it is you're, you want to do. You just... you, you, you're you adding things to it. Nope. Never, you ever, 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 give ever, up. ever, ever, <laughs> ever give up. Let me, let me add another ever in case you missed it. Another ever <laughs> give up. Uh, that's, that's life. In my opinion, that's life. Never, ever give up. You're, you can take a break. Uh, my old high school coach says, take a knee. Wet your whistle, meaning have a little water, wet your whistle, take a knee if you need to, wet a whistle, but let's go, get back in the game. So it's okay to take a break. It's okay to kind of, you know, sometimes- Regroup and sometimes you're out of focus or not sure where you're supposed to be going. Yeah, you, you need some time maybe to like take a little break and see where you're, what direction you're supposed to be going, so. Correct. In, in poker, they have this thing that, you know, when you lose a big hand, they call it a tilt. You have a mm -hmm. tilt meaning for the next two to three hands, you no longer, you don't function well because you had something very powerful, emotional happen to you. They caught right. every tilt. So even in life, we have these things called tilts where things happen. People die, businesses you know, go bankrupt, uh, crimes, uh, God forbid, uh, illnesses, all these different yeah, things happen throughout yeah. your life. So remember, you know, hey, what's my outcome of my life? And one of the things is, even if I don't know, I know I'm going to be okay. What is success to you? Well, success to me, you know, has, has changed throughout the years. <laughs> right now, for me, success is having my children when I'm older, in my 80s or 90s, God willing, mm -hmm. be able to come and visit me all the time and have a very good, effective relationship with my children mm -hmm. and my spouse is very important to me. Money is transitional, meaning, you know, you have money, you don't have money, but boy, if you don't have your family and your friends and your children around you, I believe that's the greatest success. So having your child appreciate you and love you when you are older, that's one of my biggest accomplishments mm -hmm. is, and that's what I'm focusing on. So you came to LA from South Dakota Correct. And what would your biggest advice be to someone wanting to move to LA? You've been in film, you've been in finance, you've been in education. So you've been in a few different industries. You know, each one I'm sure had struggles, but you know, most people come here for film or whatever. What, what would your advice be to someone wanting to, to pursue that? First of all, 85% of success is showing up. So first of all, you have to move to Los Angeles before okay. anything begins. Now, uh, you know, the, the, the another adage is, you know, if you hang around fire long enough, 
pretty soon you're going to at least get warm and you might even catch yourself on fire. <laughs> so are you yeah. saying hang around people that are on fire? <laughs> exactly. Hang around people, come to Los Angeles, um, understand what you want to do, have a plan, have an idea. And again, I go back, never, ever, ever give up. So if you want to become an actor, if you want to become a producer, a singer, a writer, a TV host, a, whatever you want to do, become that person, but take steps, take a systematic approach, and never, ever give up. And it will happen. It will happen. Because whether you believe in the universe, God, Jesus Christ, whatever you believe in, it will happen. Just stick around. Don't give up. It will be tough because when you when you when you were born, no one put you a plaque next to you and says life <laughs> is easy. Really? I wish they did. Yeah, yeah. I obviously missed my plaque. Anyway, yeah, so. a, I didn't get that plaque either, where it says life is easy. Maybe some people got that plaque. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It sure bypassed me dramatically. Yes, yes, I would agree. <laughs> So I, I understand that there's no plaques with life is easy. Sometimes you get plaques where it says life is very, very, very hard. Right. Probably focus, have, on that, focus on that plaque for a while. Right. Do you have any closing comments for people on, on their financial uh, journey that they should be looking for right now? One of my biggest uh, uh biggest things to tell people is if you are looking for financial advice, hire expert, hire a financial advisor. Um, you don't have to necessarily, you know, meet with people that know what they're doing mm -hmm. because there's a lot of information that they can provide for you. They can guide you and can make your experience, uh, especially financial literacy and your financial health a lot better than by doing it yourself. Take time to get to know somebody. Uh, take time to build a relationship with them. I believe everybody needs to have a doctor, a lawyer, financial advisor, and a CPA. Because if you have a team around you, just like we've talked again, mm -hmm. have a good team around you of people. Even if you have a small amount of money, there's a lot of financial advisors out there that would love to help you. Even, maybe they're starting out, they, you know, they want to build, right. you build your wealth, they'll build their wealth together. Someone so just out of school or something starting out. All right. Even big firms have people that they've just hired that would love to have clients. Meet with people and invest. Invest because in 10, 20, 30 years from now, even that small $1,000 that you put into the stock market, it can grow. Um, in 5, 10, 20 years from now, you'll see that little nest egg or that little seed of a small amount. If just leaving it there and let it grow can benefit you substantially down the road. How do we find you online or reach out to you? So you're more than welcome to reach BrancoFinancial.com is our website. Uh, we're located in the greater Los Angeles area, but we also have clients all over the United States. Um, you, I, because of the show, I will give every anybody a 15 to 20 minute free conversation. You can call Thanks. us and say, I, I, I saw you on Sage. You seem like okay. a cool guy. We'll, <laughs> we'll sit with you. We have advisors in our firm that, uh, you know, that, that will sit with you and advise you free of charge. Um, again, what we want to do is we want to find out what is it that you want to do and how do we help you get there? And generally, if we're not the right people to get to, we'll help you get there. Some people need a good uh, accountant. Some people need a good trust and wills and lawyers and all these things. So we'll do the best to accommodate you in everything that you might need. Well, Thank you so much for joining us today. Do you have a website? Yes. So our website is brancafinancial.com. Okay. And I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm sure I will see you out and about. And thank you, Constantine. You can count on it, Sage. Thank you so much. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Thank you okay. so much. Thank bye -bye. you. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I will see you next Wednesday at 4 on Stream and Hub Radio. I'm Sage Stevens. See you next time. Thanks, guys.